Jesus is an expression that declares that not only do you know that the fight is on, but that you've turned the fight over unto the Lord. Because praise declares that the battle belongs to the Lord. Last week I talked to us about the faithfulness of God. And that God is faithful in spite of us in many times. That even if we don't believe that God is faithful, He cannot deny Himself. I want you to know how He's faithful. He's faithful because He is the God of the fight. He is the God that wins the battle. He is the God that is superior. He is the God that can do anything. There is not anything that is outside of his reach. There is no battle that's too hot that God cannot win. There is no situation that's too difficult that he cannot heal. We're serving a God that created everything through the spoken word. And it's that same God that we find rest in and we trust in. But the same way that the Lord has saved us, we need to learn how to draw from our salvation. And praise is a way that helps us draw from our salvation. Because praise is the attitude of faith. It's the attitude of faith. We talk a lot about the word of faith. But the word of faith has to be supported with the attitude of faith. Because the attitude of faith says, I believe God. That's it. There's nothing else. It's not complicated. It doesn't have to be some long phraseology. It doesn't have to be articulate. It doesn't have to be profound. It's simply, I believe God. And when you believe God, praise has an attitude. It's an attitude of faith. And it activates expectation. It activates intention that while I sit in the midst of this darkness and why I feel like I'm going to be overwhelmed because I've cried out to the Lord and I'm waiting on the Lord that though I fall, I shall inevitably rise again. See, understanding the faithfulness of God that when you fall, Or when you feel yourself slipping, your praise is more precious to God when you praise. Because he knows that you've had to adjust your attitude to extend to him that praise. And God is looking for a heart that beats after him, that will believe him and declare that I believe God. Say it with me. Say, I believe God. 2 Chronicles chapter number 20, verse number 15 through 22. The situation is is interesting. Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, they found themselves surrounded by the enemy. They felt that they were going to be enveloped and overthrown. They did not know what they were going to do. And in verse 15 says, and he said, hearken all ye uh, Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude. Don't be afraid for what you are up against. Don't be afraid of the intensity of the battle. Don't be afraid because the thing that's striking you and appearing to To damage what's precious to you. It's taking you off. It's unexpected to you, but it's not unexpected to God. That while you were living your life and you were striving to do what God wanted you to do. And you found yourself under attack. And this attack seemed to be effective. It seemed to be effective against your kids. It seemed to be effective against your marriage. It seemed to be effective at where you work. And it's taken you off of guard, but it has never taken God off of guard. 
So he says, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of the great multitude. Watch it. For the battle is not yours but God's. For the battle is not yours, it's God's. You see, the praise that raises is the praise that understand the battle was never mine. The battle was always God's. This is why there's different degrees of praises. This is why there are some that will praise God with such an intention. They don't care what their neighbor is thinking. They don't care what people are feeling. They're just going to praise him so intentionally because they know that the battle is not theirs, that it belongs to God. But as they praise God, as they intentionally seek after God, they know that they're sending an SOS code out to God. They're sending out a praise that's bringing God into the battle. You got to learn how to bring God into the battle. You can't just say, well, God knows and it's in God's hands. No, your praise will determine that. Because your praise will raise you. But if you choose to complain, you're going to remain. Too many people, when the the battle becomes intensified, they'll start complaining, so they're just going to remain where they're at. Every praiser will always be raised from where they're at. See, the battle belongs to the Lord, but the victory begins through you. The victory does not begin with God. The victory begins through you, because the victory begins through your attitude. The moment you understand that the battle belongs to the Lord and you allow the presence of God to fall on you and to strengthen you and where your faith is grounded to the reality that everything is going to be okay. It's not what I wanted. It's not what I expected. But I trust the word of the Lord. I trust the outcome of God. That in the end of it, I'm going to be standing. And in the end of it, I'm going to see the mighty hand of God rush in and deliver and restore whatever has been lost to me. He goes on and begins to explain the details. And then in verse 17, he says, You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O ye Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Dismayed means confused. He said, Don't fear, don't be confused. Confusion is when two states of mind collide. Confusion is the state when you believe God in one moment, but in the next thought, the enemy tells you you're going to lose everything and you're going to be defeated. You got to realize and understand that you've got to be steadfast and unmovable because praise aligns you up with God. Praise pushes the enemy out of the way. Praise cats catches out the thoughts that try to abide to divide you. So your response has got to be with some praise. Praise that allows you to be raised. So he says, the fight is not yours. The fight belongs unto God. He says, you can't be fearful. You can't feel sorry for yourself. You can't be vulnerable to the elements. You can't feel that you are inadequate and you don't have what it takes to win the fight. Because again, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. You've got to settle the fact that not only have you experienced salvation, but salvation has power inside of you to face the issues of life. That whatever life presents to you, there is power in you to face those situations in life. And as you begin to praise God, as you begin to offer up God that praise, it taps in to that power that's inside of you and your attitude will adjust. That you're not going to buckle under this thing. That you're not going to cave into this thing. That you're not going to surrender over to this thing. Watch what he says to them. He says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O O, uh, Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Watch this. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head 
with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. When they heard the news, they responded with praise. That praise adjusted their attitude. To the reality that whatever God has said and whatever God has declared, that is going to be the outcome. Go out and face the battle tomorrow. But God's going to be with you in that battle. He didn't say you wouldn't have to face the battle. He didn't say you wouldn't have to endure the battle. He simply said, when you go out to the battle, I'm going to be with you. And he said, don't be dismayed. Don't listen to the negative thoughts. Don't listen to the biting elements that wants to pull on you and cause you to cave in and quit. He says, don't listen to all of that. He said, understand that the Lord is going to be with you. And when they believed that the Lord was going to be with them, they offered him up the praise of Barak. There are seven praises in the Hebrew. One of them is the praise of Barak. It's a powerful praise in the Hebrew language. This is personal praise too. There's congregational praise or corporate praise. But this is personal praise. Because you got to realize you got to win the battle individually, not corporately. It's not about you winning the battle here together as a body of believers. But you got to win the battle out there as an individual. Because greater is he that's in you as an individual than whatever it is up against you. So you've got to understand and believe God in the face of whatever the situation is. Even in that sense of vulnerability, when you come before the Lord, you believe in Him and you're stretching and you're offering Him praise. What will happen is there will be an overwhelming sensation that you will see the victory in your outcome. And Barak is a praise of humility. It's a praise of humility because you know that God is covering you. It means to humble yourself, to lower yourself, to bow yourself before God. It recognizes, God, I could never do it on my own. And so I humble myself before you. This is why we come to an altar many times and we bow our knees. We're actually offering God the praise of Barak. We're blessing God because we're realizing, God, I can't do it in my strength. And and God, I can't do it on my own. So I humble myself because as I humble myself with the praise of Barak and I lower myself, I am loosing God to be raised in my life. That when God is raised in my life, then God will turn around and raise me. But I got to humble myself and realize I can't do it without me. I can't do it through my own strength, through my own ability, through my own talents. I don't have the fortitude. I don't have the attitude. I don't have the the independence to be able to win in the face of certain battles. Certain battles. Certain battles. Oh, live long enough and there'll be something that will knock you down. There'll be something that you'll face, that your attitude will be challenged, that your face will be rattled, and the enemy will try to rejoice. But as Micah said today, rejoice not against me, oh my adversaries, when I fall. Don't rejoice against me when I fall because when you are a believer and you are in the kingdom of God, there's no one that can keep you down. You may fall down, but you cannot stay down. Not when you're a believer. Not when His Spirit is inside of you. Because the Spirit of the Lord will call you up. The Word of God will meet you right where you are at. And it will meet you to lift you up. But when the Word lifts you up, you understand that you've got to offer a Barak unto God. Because it's only by His mercy and it's only by His grace does He step in and begin to provide the strength for you to be able to see the victory. It's interesting because the Hebrew word to praise God is Barak and it's translated in the English word, bless. 
that the praise blesses God. It blesses Him. Why? When we humble ourselves, when we realize it's not us, but rather it is Him. A true sense of humility, where even our attitudes are in aligned, that there is no arrogance within us. Yes, did you see what happened? That happened because I'm so anointed. Did you see the breakthrough that I experienced? Oh, that's just because I've worked so hard and the favor of God is in my life. That's why that happened at work. No, it happened because there's a God that gave you his name and chose you to be his son and put his spirit inside of you and saw you were going to be destroyed. And he stepped in the situation and he rescued you because he loves you. But uh, Barak means to where you kneel down, where you humble yourself. This is a surrendering of an individual self. And what, what, what happens is that as you are humbling yourself and, and you are prostrate before God, you are recognizing how awesome God is and how great God is. And you're realizing, God, you can do this. And, and you will go from God, you can do this, to God, you will do this. Because it's that humility through that Barak praise that allows you to be raised where you can begin to display the power of God. Listen, in Philippians chapter number 2, I'm not going there, it's not even a part of my message today, but the Bible says that Jesus humbled himself unto death. He humbled himself unto death. Why did Jesus humble himself unto unto death? Because the whole outworking of salvation is a display of the praise of Barak. Well, how is that? Because you have a God that is superior. You have a God that is, is transcending in every way. And he condescends down to this earth where the creator becomes his own created being. What is that? That's a humbling of the creator where he becomes his own creation. There was a humbling in Philippians tells us that he humbled himself and that he he literally put aside his divine prerogatives functioning as a man. But the act of humbling himself was in a position to bless God that when he would die when there would be a greater humbling and he would be buried in the earth and ultimately go to hell, what would happen? There would be a raising or there would be a rising because humility always loses God's power to raise. Are you listening to me today? So it's it's a picture of that. This is something that it's not just an idea. This This is woven within the Hebrew culture itself. Amen. And so what is happening, they, they go out to battle. And the Bible says in uh, verse number 20, and they arose early in the morning. They went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And they went forth. And Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Jerusalem, and ye inhabitants, or rather uh, Judah, and all you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and so shall you be established. Believe his prophets and so shall you prosper. So he says, believe in the Lord your God and so shall you be, everyone say, established. That means stabilize. Believe in your prophets. That means the word, the rhema word that comes forth. He says, so shall you prosper, so shall you increase. And when he had consulted with the people, watch this, he appointed singers un, unto the Lord and, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the armies and to say praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever now you got to think about that Israel was coming out to battle to meet the enemy they felt that they didn't have the strength to win the battle they felt disadvantaged outnumbered 
that the enemy was going to overthrow them. So there stood their enemy with swords and spears and arrows, and they were ready for combat. And then all of a sudden, when the, when the armies of Jerusalem comes out, they sent out kind of like what you would consider uh, a band of musicians come out. And they've got instruments. And they don't got weapons of war, but weapons of praise. They have instruments because they realize the battle is not theirs. They've come to that point that the battle was not theirs, but to activate and loose the power of God in their situation, they were going to release praise. And through that praise, it would activate the power of God. That while they were praising God, verse 22, and when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, and when they began to sing and they began to praise the Lord, that distinct cry that they were loosing, loosing before God, they were sending that SOS code up, bringing God into the battle. The moment they began to praise God, something began to change. In that moment, the Lord set an ambushment against the children of Amnon and Moab and Mount Seir which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. I like that, ambushment. The Lord sent an ambushment. The Lord sent a raid and overwhelmed them. The Lord overthrew the enemy. How? What was Judah doing? Judah was praising. Judah was shouting. Judah was singing. Judah was saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Judah was saying, The holiness of God. Judah was saying, His mercy endureth forever. In other words, they were recognizing it was not through the arm of flesh that they were going to experience victory, but it was through the arm of God's mercy. Now watch this, when you go up some, against something like that, and there is a battle and it's intense and it demands that you offer God that praise, that distinct praise where you have felt rattled, I want you to know there are spoils in the outcome. There are rewards that God is going to bring to his people to engage battles that have been intense. Because watch verse number 25. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoils of them, they found amongst them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off from them, off from themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoils because it was so much. After the Lord sent the ambushment and overthrew the enemy, God did not say, well, the enemy has been defeated there before you walk away. God said, no, I've used this situation and because you praise your way through and I've raised you out of it, now I've got reward after the raising. And they went out there and there was thousands of thousands of dead bodies and all of their gold and silver. God said, all of it belongs to you. You see, God wins the battle, but he shares his the reward. Clap your hands unto the Lord. See, we need to realize this, that praise is an expression of victory to win every battle. Praise is an expression of victory to win every battle. You win it in your attitude first. It's not trying to predetermine the outcome. It's not seeing the perfect outcome. It's realizing no matter how this thing ends, I win because my mind is set on God. And I'm going to trust the outcome no matter what it's going to be, that he is going to be with me. And whatever I lose, I know that God will restore unto me. So it's an attitude of victory. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, please. I want to give you these scriptures. These are good scriptures to have with you to write down. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Thanks be unto God for why? Because he always causes us to triumph in Christ. 
The word triumph is victory. Thanks be unto God because he's always going to lead the situation in the end ultimately to be victory for us that are in Christ. And maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. And maketh manifest. And maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge. The sweetness of his knowledge by us in every place. In other words, when you have the attitude of victory and you can say thanks be unto God. That's always going to cause me to triumph in Christ. In any situation. I'm going to triumph in that situation. And you have that attitude before the outcome even displays itself. But you have an attitude of victory. What happens is you begin to start losing a fragrance before the presence of God. You begin to lose a perfume before the presence of God. And that that God is drawn to that situation because you believe his word. You stand on his word. You speak his word. You meditate his word. You praise because of his word. Let me read it to you in the Amplified. He says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us to triumph, watch this, as trophies of Christ's victories. As trophies of Christ's victories. There's some people here today that when you were young, you were a part of some activity and you strived to win because you wanted to win the trophy. You didn't just run the race to run the race, you wanted to win the trophy. Well, understand this, in every battle and every trial that you go through, there's a trophy that's going to be at the end of that battle that God has for you. And he has predetermined to inform his people that because you are in Christ and that anointing that's present in there, you can tap into that kratos power. And through that kratos power, you can have victory. This is where we see a higher level of power than just kratos. It's called iskos. Iskos in Greek. I'll talk more about it later. This means prevailing power. This means prevailing power. It understands that victory belongs to me because what has been accomplished. It understands that I cannot lose the joy of the Lord in the midst of any situation because I refuse to lose my focus on God at any time. I am telling you there is a focus that you can have in God and praise is how you develop that focus on God. Because praise, praise, praise in the English term, the etymology of praise would be uh, to appraise an item. Like when you're going to buy a house, you don't just pay the full amount of the house. You want to get what is called an appraisal of the house. The appraisal of the house determines to do to you the value of the house. And then through the value of the house, you consider the market value in the community, and then you determine what you're willing to pay for the house. But the appraisal determines the value. Well, your praise determines God's value in your life. That in any battle that you go through, the intensity of that battle, the first thing is you've got to weigh the intensity of that battle and the value of who God is in your life. And praise is valuing God more than any trial and any circumstance that you go through. It's realizing who He is in your life and what He's done for you and your commitment to that. That you offer Him the praise. Everyone say the praise. I, I know that, you know, at times it, it can feel that we've got a great amount of problems. Great situations that can uh, be very frustrating for us. But sometimes what you need to do is to really gain perspective that your problems are not as extensive as that you think they are. For example, we were at conference this week and it was a wonderful time while we were there and Every time I go to Indianapolis for any type of conference, I know that there's homeless people everywhere. And it always grips my heart. And so I always determine that while I'm there, I'm going to feed somebody while we're there. And so 
I just kind of pray, and you can just kind of pick who you're going to uh, pray with and feed and, or whatever it is, how you're going to help. And so I went and I, and I approached uh, this family that I saw that was there, two, two individuals, and I approached them, and I said, hey, are you guys hungry? And they said, oh, we're starving. And I said, well, you're going to eat good today, and I had a, just a good meal for them. And then I said, what's your name? And they said, uh, I'm Matthew. He's Mark. I wanted to say, and I'm Luke, and that's John. <laughs> but I didn't do it. I was real tempted to do it. But you know, first impressions and all. And then um, when I gave him the food and he saw it, he said, oh, that looks so good. He says, I just want to look at it for a moment. And I said, hey, that's okay. He says, oh, yesterday I, I had to eat out of a dumpster and I got a little sick. I said, well, you're not going to eat out of a dumpster today. And the situation was so meager and desperate. And when he told me he was eating out of a dumpster, it just broke my heart. And then you think about people that say, oh, I've got these problems. You're not going to eat out of a dumpster when you leave church. You've got a place to go to when you leave church. You're going to rest your head on a pillow somewhere. You've got a roof that, that's going to cover you. I'm just telling you, you got to gain perspective. This individual, Matthew, he's got problems. Mark, who was whacked out with drugs, he really got problems. And of course, I ministered to them, but the point is this. I began to see my situations based on their circumstances. And it gave me perspective to my situation. Because when you're going to learn how to praise God and, and, and understand especially the praise that raises You've got to have this attitude, an attitude that praise helps you to deliver, but to de uh, develop. But once you develop it, you want to be able to sustain the attitude. You don't want to lose the attitude. You don't want your victory to be predicated on circumstances that you're on the mountaintop so you have victory. I'm in the valley. I'm living in defeat. You don't want to be predictable that we can determine whether you're doing good or bad based on how you praise. Your praise should simply be an indication that you have the attitude of victory that you've settled it. As in Psalms 34 verse number 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. Your praise should be predictable to the, to the fact that you see victory in every situation. Not that you don't have feelings, not that you don't bleed, not that you're not hurt, but you refuse to be rattled in your faith. You refuse to be destabilized in your faith. That you know who your faith is in, that you're in. Your faith is in the creator of the universe. The God that spoke everything into existence. The one that has redeemed you. The one that died for you. The one that loves you. And again, that's at there in Psalms 34, verse number 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. The word bless there is Barak. I will at all times. At whatever news that I get, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. It's an attitude that you've got to learn how to engage if you want to live in that high realm with God. I've lost my job. What are you going to do? Bless the Lord when you lose your job. I don't have enough money to pay the bills. What am I going to do? I'm going to bless the Lord. It's what I'm going to do. It's not saying that each time and at every time, God's going to provide the abundance. And many times he will. But if you're living in shortage, your praise should not be predicated on stuff. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. My soul, my soul. See, your soul, that's your attitude. It's going to make her boast in the Lord. The devil didn't give you the joy, so the devil can't steal the joy. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. The humble, it's because it's the brock, it's the lowering, it's the humbling of this. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. See, that's what praise does. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. 
magnify, magnify, enlarge your perspective. See God in every situation. I know at times you're hurting and it's difficult and the kids are acting up and the situations are not all perfect, but I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The humble shall hear thereof and be God. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord with me. You see, when you have this kind of praise where you can magnify the Lord, what you do, you bring confusion to the enemy. Because you see, when you're up under attack, he's trying to bring confusion to you. And praise will always set you on a sure foundation. Praise will, will pull all confusion out of you. You may start off, I don't even feel like praising. What is he talking about? Got my kids acting out crazy, don't have enough money for this. He's talking about shouting. I'm not talking about shouting for anything. You got to realize praise always has an object. You're shouting because of an object. You're shouting because of the king of glory. Who is the king of glory? The Lord most glorious and high. You're, you're shouting for a reason. You see, I can't, I can't give you the, the picture of God. That's what he presents to you when he's redeemed you. But you've got to focus on that. And you've got to look on that. And you've got to be fixed on that. That as you are fixed on that and you magnify that, you confuse your enemy. Because your praise will do something to you. And when it does something to you, it'll do something to your enemy. Come on, let's put our hands together and bless the Lord together. Watch what he says. Watch what he says when you begin to praise the Lord. Watch what he says. He says, the angels of the Lord encamp about them that fear him. The word fear means respect. He says, when you begin to praise the Lord and you get fixed and you get focused, that the angels of the Lord all of a sudden come, they come to where you are at. And they begin to surround you. Who surrounds you? The angels of the Lord begin to surround you. Why are they surrounding you? Because they see that praise that is going out unto God. While you're confusing the devil and those demon forces, you're causing the angels to come and to surround you because they're seeing that holy reverence that you have for God. Hallelujah. Watch this. The angels of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him and deliver them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Oh, taste and see. See, your praise is taking a taste of who God is. Your praise is sampling the victory that God has for you. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You can't just think that he's good. You just can't consider that he's good. you got to send out that praise. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye, sa ye his saints, for there is none want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack, and they do suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. 
Oh, hallelujah. They that seek the Lord, how are they seeking the Lord? They're seeking the Lord through their praise. That's why I can't come to church and just sit here and be so proper and just simply think I don't want to wrinkle my clothes and I don't, I, God forbid that I perspire and, and all this. No, I've come. I've got to seek after the Lord. I've got to touch the Lord for myself. I'm glad I got a worship in church and I got a praise in church, but I can't depend upon your praise to touch God for me. My praise is going to touch God and you can't depend upon your pastor's praise. Your praise has got to touch God oh taste and see that the Lord is good blessed is the man that makes the Lord don't lose your praise I said don't lose your praise you've got to be able to realize that your praise moves mountains Watch what he says in verse 15. And this is all about praise. He said, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Oh, it it distinguishes you now. It distinguishes you now. First it says, blessed is the person that trusts him. It says that you're tasting. It says, oh, he said, but the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. That means God sees your praise. I said, God sees your praise. That, that's why you got to praise more than when you're in church here. You've got to praise when the hell's breaking out. You've got to praise when the fight breaks out at the house. You've got to get in the closet or you've got to get somewhere and say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises. You've got to do it at work. You've got to do it in the car. You've got to do it in the grocery store. You've got to make sure that you've got to praise. Each time you praise, you bring God into the battle. And each time you praise, you confuse the enemy. Rejoice not against me, O my enemies, when I fall. I shall arise. For when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Why is he going to be a light unto me? Because my praise has located him. Rebecca. Woo! The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open unto their cry. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. Who's the broken hearted? The one that pray is in. It's not just saying everything is perfect. I'm broken hearted. I'm hurting. I'm in a situation. But God, you deserve all praise. God, I've measured my situation. It does not warrant me holding back. But it demands that I still give you the praise. If my arm is hurting, I can't lift it up. I'll get it as high as I can lift it up. If I can't jump the way I used to jump, I'll bounce. And that's all I got is a bounce. The Lord is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and save such of a contrite spirit. I love it right here. This should be highlighted in your Bibles. Many are the afflicted of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. I'm telling you, it don't matter where you're at right now because your praise is raising you. Your praise is going to take you out of that. Your praise is going to put you in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca. I got a revelation for you today. I got a revelation for you today. There is a praise that raises. There is a praise called Yada. Yada is a circular arm of victory. 
You die as a praise when the arm stretches out to God and says, God, you're worthy. You die throws blessings unto God in the midst of whatever it is they're going through. They refuse to be held back. Come on, praise them and get your attitude back. Praise them and experience victory. That's it, that's it. Whatever you got, you give it unto him. Hey! Glory! Praise! Glory! So you ain't bothering me. Just keep it on a hush. You keep that praise. How many want to be like Jesus? I I'm going to show you how Jesus danced in the Bible too. I'm going to show you how Jesus shouted in the Bible too. I'm going to show you how Jesus would be here. Jesus would be doing the same thing we're doing. Some of you think this is weird, but you didn't think it was weird when you were in the nightclub. You didn't think it was weird Friday night around 10.30 in the nightclub. When they were dancing because they were under an influence. Well, we dancing because we under an influence. They were dancing because they were trying to get away from their problems. We're dancing because we know God has needed our problems. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Let me show you Jesus. Let me show you Jesus. I want you to see Jesus. I want you to see your Jesus. Your Jesus that you say he's your Savior. Your Jesus that you say he's your Lord. Your Jesus that, you know, what was that band? Uh, w, W, what is it? What, what, J, what would Jesus do? Remember that? Well, we're going to see what Jesus would do. We're going to see what he would do. Luke chapter 10. Ha! I love being saved. I said I love being saved. Luke chapter 10, verse number 17. And the 70 return again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. They return with joy. That term joy there means to shout. So when you got victory over devils, you shout. If you can't shout, I got to question your victory. Wait a minute. Wait for it. Wait for it. Watch what Jesus says. And Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. They brought that up that the devils were subject. And Jesus says, every time I think of the devil, he says, all I do is think about him falling. Here's a revelation for you. The devil attacks you so much because he's always falling. And he knows because you're the believer that when you praise, you're always being raised. So he's falling, but you're being raised. 
He's going down, but you going up. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Hey, I feel some victory. I said I feel some victory. When I was standing in this rejoice not Don't rejoice that the devils are subject to you But rejoice rather Because your names are written in heaven Let me give you the number one reason to praise the Lord Woo! The number one reason to praise the Lord is this right here Jesus said, I'm going to bypass all the warfare. I'm going to bypass all the conflicts. Yeah, you're going to defeat the enemy and you're going to see them be cast out. But he said, don't, don't rejoice because of that or don't praise because of that. I'm going to tell you why to praise. He says, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Or what he is saying is this. I want you to step past all the warfare. I want you to step past all the conflict. And I want you to go all the way to the end. Because in the end, and you're going to be raised all the way to heaven. Now watch what after Jesus says that. Jesus got a picture of us all when we go to heaven. And in Revelation 19, the Bible says we're dancing around the throne. And we're shouting hallelujah unto the Lamb of God. Woo. Okay. Okay. I just want to get to Jesus. I just want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be any more. I don't want to be any less. Verse 21. Give me verse 21. I want everyone to see verse 21. Woo. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. He rejoiced in what? And said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou had hid these things from the wise and the prudent, but you have revealed them unto babes, even so, Father. For so it seems good in thy sight. Next verse. Oh, no, 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 there it is right there. In the same hour, Jesus rejoiced. There it is, rejoice. In the same hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. And said, I, let me tell you, rejoice is the Greek word, uh, kahiro. This is what, I want you to hear it, what it means. It means to be, uh, to be full of, to leap, to jump, to twirl with excitement. So keep, keep it up there. In the same hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. He began to leap. He began to twirl. He began to shout and begin to thank God that he's revealed it unto babes. So if you want to be like Jesus, there is a leap, there is a shout. I know the elders can't praise like they used to praise. So I need some of you young folks to praise for the elders. Praise for the elders. Hallelujah! Now sing it. My dance is crusaded under my feet. And I declare I got victory. My dance is crusaded under my feet. And I declare I got victory. Under my feet, I 
Oh, yeah. 